Hello and welcome to Let the Bible Speak. My name is Alex Meredith. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Uh, as you might notice, we are not in the studio today. I'm actually here at the church building at the Marquette Church of Christ. Uh, we're doing something a little different for today and this will extend into next week as well. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing a, a couple of lessons here called Demystifying the Church. Now, here's what we're going to be doing here. We are going to be walking through and explaining what it's like to come here on a Sunday morning. Um, the goal here is we're trying to pull back the curtain a little bit. Uh, I, I'm sure I've expressed this on the program before, but you know what we really want to do is, um, you know, I know that there are a lot of viewers here that uh, are unable to make it out due to their health or um, you know, other reasons, work, schedules, things like that. Um, but we would love as many people as possible to be a part of the local church. And we would love for uh, all of you to know that you're invited here, you're welcome here um, anytime you, you desire to come. Now, along with that, I know that one of the scariest parts of that process is going somewhere new going somewhere where you don't know how they do things. You don't know what to expect. Um, I, I remember being in a number of situations before in my life where I've gone into um, you know, some other place that I, I had no idea what they were doing or what they wanted me to do in that instance or if I could participate or not. You know, uh, There's just a lot of uncertainty, and that uncertainty a lot of times can lead us to just not even try. Right, So I, I don't want that to be a barrier to any of you who might be interested in, uh, in attending or uh, being a part of the church here. I, I don't want any barriers like that to exist. So what we're going to do is we're, we're going to walk through the process of what it's like here on a Sunday morning. We'll talk about what we do, and we'll talk a little bit about why we do it and, and get into the biblical explanation for some of those things. All right, so that that's my uh my spiel to start us out i think one of the first things that people would like to know is what do i wear what do i wear uh it's it's one of the biggest you know we're very self-conscious about that right because we go into a place and we don't want to be underdressed we don't want to uh you know everybody else is in suits and ties and dresses and everything else and we walk in with something very different. And likewise, I don't think we would like to be the ones, the only one in a suit and tie and everyone else, you know, no one else has that. Uh, it would make us stand out too much. And, you know, what do we, what do we wear to worship? I think it's one of the most common questions uh, and one of the most practical questions we can address here to start off. Now, a, a few things to mention about this from a biblical perspective. When we're talking about gathering as a church, uh, we talk about it as a memorial. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, Paul, in talking about communion, uh, where and we'll talk more about that specifically later, but when we talk about communion, we're uh, talking about a memorial to remember the sacrifice of Christ, the death of Christ. So you could almost think of it like, well, what would I wear to a friend's memorial service? Um, how, would I, how would I prepare for that? How would I dress for that? We also know that in Scripture we're called on to do our best in everything uh, because as we do everything in our life, we're doing it uh, in the presence and for the honor of God. I think about Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. So maybe that's something to consider in that equation. I also think about Paul's call to modesty in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Um, you know, and you could think about modesty in two different ways. You could think, well, you know, we should be modest with our beauty, and that's typically the way that modesty is ta is thought about. Uh, but you should also be modest with maybe what you have. Just because you can afford this really nice, really expensive thing, does that mean you should bring it to show it off a little bit? Uh, maybe not, right? Maybe that's not the point of why we gather uh, on a Sunday morning. Ultimately, I, I think when you were talking about what we wear, uh, yeah, maybe we should try to do our best, but I think ultimately there's some, it's an arbitrary distinction. James chapter, chapter 2, starting in verse 2, I want to read this to you. 
For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? All right, so... I don't know that there's a, a concrete blueprint. And I, I think the funny thing in this passage is that neither of them are necessarily criticized for what they wear. It's the way that they're received, right? And if the church is doing what it's supposed to do, nobody's going to look down on you or you know kick you out because of what you do or don't wear uh, on a Sunday morning. Now, let's talk about singing. Singing. Uh, this is a sensitive topic for some people. I'm going to pull something out here. Whoops. This is the hymnal that we use uh, on Sunday mornings when, um, when, when we do sing. Here's how we go about it. Typically, we're all there in the auditorium upstairs. Uh, we don't have pews. We have those linked chairs, you know, if you're familiar with those. But we have them in rows, and they're facing towards the front up to a little small stage up there. And so when it's time for songs to be sung, we, we have one song leader uh, that normally varies depending on um, it, week by week. We have one song leader per service. So the song leader will go up. He will take a hymnal, open it up to a song, set it down there on the pulpit, and then he will start the song in a certain key. And sometimes he'll move his hand to the, um, to the rit- rhythm of the song to lead people in that song and show them the pace of it and everybody in that auditorium also has their hymnals open and they too are singing along with the song leader it's not just the song leader up there that's singing it's everybody in the whole auditorium is invited to sing and join in that singing now why do we do that well first of all and we're going to go to a few passages here uh it's commanded we could go to a lot of different places for this Uh, But in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, we're told this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So sing those songs of praise, right? We also know that when we sing, we're following this biblical example that's been set for us. What do we see Jesus and the disciples doing uh, right after the Passover feast, the institution of the Lord's Supper, which again, we'll we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, But right after they finished that, it said, and when they had sung a hymn, they went up to the Mount of Olives. Singing was a regular part of uh, the worship process for Jesus, for his disciples, and for the early church. We also know that when we sing, uh, when we sing words of praise, we are singing to God who is worthy to receive that praise. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, you have the, the 24 elders in the throne room of God singing, quote, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. We also know that we sing in order to recall the works of God. So part of what we do when we sing is we're, we're praising God, meaning that we're identifying the attributes of God, uh, of God's character. We're talking about who he is. We're also talking about what he's done. So in Psalm 105 verse 1, O give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. So we're recalling the works of God, and we're reminding each other, right? We're reminding each other of what God has done, and there's something encouraging about that. We also know that singing, it's an outpouring of our emotion. It's a way for us to express how we feel when we don't know how else to do it. Uh, that's the best way I've come to conceptualize it. So in James chapter 5, verse 13, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Right? Now, if you were to come to the Marquette Church on a Sunday morning, 
you may you might be it depends on your background and what you're used to and maybe what you grew up with but you might be a little surprised to find out that uh, as you come into our auditorium we don't have a piano we don't have an organ we don't have guitars we don't have a drum set or anything like that when we sing we just sing um and I thought I'd spend just, just a minute here to explain why it is that we do that. And it really boils down to three reasons. Uh, first of all, there's the biblical reason, the biblical case for it. We see that in the Old Testament, and if you see me reaching over to my left here on this side, I'm reaching over to my notes here so that I can see them. Um, we see that in the Old Testament, instrumentation was very common. Uh, in the worship process. In fact, in 1 Chronicles chapter 23, verse 5, we see David assigning all of these people to be in charge of the creation of musical instruments to be used in worship. But even in the Old Testament itself, uh, it recognized the danger of empty worship, right? Uh, there's a passage in Amos chapter 6 that talks about people who, uh, you know, are participating in these, quote, idle songs played by the harp you know and they're they really just become passive participants in that case and it's not there's really no substance to it uh, and then secondly uh, the second part of that biblical reasoning is that in the new testament when we do have ecclesiastical worship described meaning the worship of uh, the church gathering when we do have that described there are no instances of uh, instrumentation being used so the basic thought there is that's the formula we're given. We don't really feel we have the right to change that. There's a historical reason as well. Uh, historically, we know that the early church did not utilize instrumentation in worship. And this was really the case up until around the 10th century AD. Um, it was not common at all. In fact, it, uh, it was often spoken against because of its association with um, non-religious or you know, alternative religious practices. There's a practical uh, case for this also. Instrumental worship, and uh, and this is where I get a little bit into, I suppose you could say my opinion, although this is, uh, I don't know, so, something I, I suppose I've observed in, again, just in my experience. Instrumental worship doesn't seem to be as conducive to thoughtful and collective worship. Uh, when you do have something become a more of a performance, uh, the focus on the content tends to dissipate and people become less inclined to participate in that process. People are a lot more inclined to, to think, well, I'm not as good as those singers up there, so why would I join in and make it sound worse, you know? Uh, now, again, it, it's not my place to make any sort of final judgment on those who practice differently uh, in this regard, but... Um, this is what the Marquette Church has decided to do, and I thought I'd give you a little explanation of why that is. Now, with regards to worship, uh, I've found a few, what I think are some pretty interesting quotes here. Uh, people observing early Christian worship services. Pliny in 112 AD describes it this way. He says, they sang in alternate verses a hymn to Christ. Uh, Justin Martyr, in the middle of the second century, describes the people sing out their ascent. Uh, Clement of Alexandria, sometime towards the end of the second century, describes Christians praising, hymning, blessing, singing. One last note on singing before I leave this topic here. Um, Psalm 100, Psalm 100 verse 1 says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord. It doesn't say make a skillful noise to the Lord. I know that a lot of people's apprehension with singing is, well, I don't, you know, I'm not a very good singer. And if I sing, then the people in front of me are going to turn around and say, what, what are they doing? You know, it doesn't say make a skillful, perfect pitch noise to the Lord. It says make a joyful noise to the Lord. It has a lot less to do with how good of a singer you are and a lot more to do with, uh, do you mean what you say? Do you really believe it? Right. So just a last point of encouragement there uh, for those of us who are uh, hesitant singers, including myself, by the way. It took, took a long time to get over that. Okay, so now we've talked about dress. Um, we've talked about singing. Now let's take a second to talk about prayer. Now this is, again, something else that a lot of people are very nervous about. Um, and part of it, I know, is that 
you know, when we talk about prayer within different groups, we're talking about maybe different things or people imagine different things or there are different postures that people take and different phrases that are said. When we're talking about prayer, fundamentally, we are talking about talking to God. This can be done on an individual level. This can be done congregationally as a group. This can be verbal, nonverbal. It can be anytime, anywhere. Uh, because God's presence is within every Christian, right? It's not localized to some far-off temple. You can pray uh, wherever and whenever you'd like. So when we pray here at the Marquette Church, here's typically how it goes. Similar to how we have a song leader come up, we typically have somebody who will get up and they will go to the front. Uh, they will either go up onto the stage behind a pulpit where there's a microphone just so people can hear them. Uh, or they'll go down to the communion table where there's a microphone as well, uh, and they'll, they'll pray. And typically, they and most of the people in the auditorium will bow their heads, close their eyes like this. And that's what most people tend to do. And so the person will go through the prayer. Uh, oftentimes, they are uh, thanking God for things that he has done. Uh, they are requesting things. So maybe we're praying for people who are sick. We're praying for their healing. Um, so we pray for God's intervention in life. We pray for his blessing. We can pray about all sorts of things, right? So when the prayer is over, typically the person leading the prayer will say, in Jesus's name or in the name of Jesus, amen. And then you'll have uh, people out in the audience say, amen. It's not a rule, you don't, you know, you're not required to say that, but the reason that that's done is when we say amen, that's actually a word that we see a lot in the New Testament, um, and a lot of the translations don't translate it, it's actually what's known as a transliteration. So the Greek letters are uh, alpha, mu, epsilon, uh, nu, which is A-M-E-N. Uh, so that word didn't get translated a lot, and so a lot of people actually don't know what it means, and all it means is Yes, I agree, truly, verily. Uh, you know, there are a lot of different ways to translate it. But essentially, when we say amen at the end of a prayer, it's this statement of yes, let that be so. I agree. It's like the prayer is the writing of a contract. And when you say amen, then what you're doing is you're making that prayer your own. It's not just the prayer, the person leading the prayer who's praying. It's the whole congregation. And we... I suppose you could say sign off on it at the end to say, yes, that is my prayer as well. So, so that's why that's done uh, in that manner. Now, why do we do it in the first place? Well, like many things, uh, we do it because it's commanded, first of all. If we go to Philippians chapter 4, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read here in verse 6. Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So we pray because it's commanded. We also know that we're following this example that's been given to us. Uh, Luke, in Luke chapter 5, verse 16, makes this really interesting remark about how Jesus uh, often went into the wilderness to pray. If Jesus did it a lot, don't you think we probably need to, Right? Uh, in Acts chapter 12, verse 5, James has been killed, uh, he's been martyred, and Peter has been thrown into prison. And you see the church faithfully lifting him up in prayer, praying on his behalf, right? So we're following this example that's given to us. Prayer can serve a number of functions as well. Uh, we pray in order to thank God for what he's done. Uh, for the things that we have, perhaps. We pray in order to praise. We see this a lot in the Psalms. We, we acknowledge who God is. That's how the Lord's Prayer starts. Uh, our Father in heaven, holy is your name. That's, that's a form of praise. It's recogni recognizing God's uh, praiseful, praiseworthy attributes. We petition God. Uh, this is normally what people only think of when they think about prayer. We're just asking God for things. Yeah, you know, that, that is part of it, but it's not the whole of it. But yeah, we can petition God for inter his intervention in life. Uh, we can also use prayer to repent, to turn away from our sins, to confess those things to God, uh, and to pray for strength to stand against temptation in the future. Ultimately, we pray because we believe that God hears us, and we believe that God is able to affect real change in the world, right? That's ultimately why we do it. 
If we look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, we read, And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. Right? And there was something mentioned there about God's will. I, I mentioned it earlier, but I didn't elaborate on it. Uh, did you notice I, I said something about how we pray in Jesus' name, right? Uh, John 14, 13, Jesus says, Whatever you ask in my name, I will grant unto you. Whatever you ask in my name. So why do we do that? Well, on one hand, we're invoking the power of the name, the, the name of Jesus. Uh, that really means something, right? We're praying that God, not just anybody, but that God takes action in this world. Nobody else can do these things, but God can. What we're also doing is we're admitting that our requests are subject to God's desire. God is not a vending machine. If he wants this to happen and you pray for it, yes, it, it, it will occur. That, that will be true. But if it's not in his will, it, you know, you can want that Corvette all you, all you want, but uh, it may not be in God's will, right? So it's a confession as well. Now, I, I know that when we, just a couple more things here on prayer. When we talk about prayer, a lot of people are concerned about posture. You know, when we look at scripture and what it says about the posture of prayer, sometimes prayer is done bowed down. Uh, we see that, I think, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. For this reason, uh, I bow my knees before the Father. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 22, we see Solomon in the dedication prayer of the temple. He's standing up, raising his hands to the heavens, praising God, uh, and then praying. We see something similar in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. I desire that uh, men everywhere uh, with their hands raised will lift up in prayer. So, you know, we see a variation there. There doesn't seem to be one definitive rule, but there certainly are warnings about being prideful or distracting uh, in the prayer process. So just something to keep in mind there. Now, one last thing we're going to get to today, we're going to talk a little bit about communion. Um, this is really the focal point of our Sunday morning assembly, communion. Sometimes it's referred to as the Lord's Supper. Sometimes it's referred to as the Eucharist. Um, and here's the very basics of it. We have this tray. This tray here will be passed around with a piece of unleavened bread. And as it's passed around, people will break it and then eat it. That bread symbolizes the flesh of Jesus, the body of Jesus. And then we have this cup. It's typically served, if I can fit this in the, in the shot, it's typically served in a tray like this. And you have a little cup. We use grape juice. Uh, some places choose to use wine. Uh, in the ancient world, the difference between the two wasn't really that significant because their wine wasn't very heavily fermented. So in any case, that's sort of an aside. But uh, we drink this cup, and that symbolizes Jesus' blood. And what it really is, is it's a reminder of Jesus' sacrifice. Uh, it's reminding us of that thing that happened 2,000 years ago. Jesus died on the cross. And as we ourselves are the ones, by the way, breaking the bread, we are in some way recognizing that we are the ones who caused that body to be broken. We are the ones consuming that blood. Uh, our sin is what put him there and held him there, right? So it's a confession. It's a statement of faith. Uh, this is commanded uh, as well in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I know I'm running short on time. Uh, I'm having to time myself here this time. I don't have the uh, wonderful help of the studio at the moment, so I'll try not to overshoot here. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we do it because it's commanded. We also see the church very early on doing this as a regular regular part of their first day of the week gathering in Acts chapter 20 verse 7. It mentions it almost casually uh, as a passing remark. 
And I think the reason for that is it was so well established. People knew that on the first day of the week, you broke bread. And so in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, as Paul is passing through the city of Troas, they broke bread together, right? And uh, as I mentioned before, this is a reminder of Jesus' sacrifice. Um, that's why in verse 26, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Verse 29, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Uh, it forces us to reflect. You know, are we living like people for whom Christ died, right? Uh, now, as far as the format of the process, you know, we, we have somebody who will lead a prayer. Typically, they'll pass around this, uh, this tray. It's open to anyone to take, by the way. Uh, what we tell people is that all Christian, Christians are invited to take us. And as far as we're concerned, if you're not a Christian and you take it, well, it's nothing more than unleavened bread and, <laughs> and, and grape juice. You know, you're just, you're just having a snack. Um, but it, it's open to anyone to take. Uh, up to their discretion, uh, we tell everybody, uh, everybody that cri all Christians are invited to participate in this. Um, now, uh, there's some discussion, is this something that, well, why don't we take it around a table like a meal? Well, you know, we could. Uh, we could. But the current format that we have, and we see the Corinthians messing up with this, they had turned it into something that was nothing more than this social gathering, and they're chastised for it, you know, and um, we're, we want to make sure that we protect against those human tendencies towards divisiveness, towards gluttony, towards forgetfulness. Uh, the Corinthian church had gotten so far off in the way that they practice. He says in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 20, he says, what you're taking isn't actually uh, the Lord's Supper. So <laughs> we, we don't want to make that mistake. Well, I really want to thank you for joining me uh, in this first week as we go through talking about demystifying the church. What we're going to do next week is we're going to continue this process. We're going to talk about giving. We're going to talk about uh, the sermon. We're going to talk about the invitation, about baptism, all those different things we're going to get to uh, next week. So I hope you're, you're able to join us for that as well. May God bless you. I hope that you have a wonderful week.